like scary movies. Uh -huh. Oh yes, we do. Horror art is seriously fun to create in Photoshop, but can be tricky to master because of the dark ambient lighting and the fantasy elements. But fear not, fans of the macabre, today we're going to give you the lowdown on how to ramp up the creep factor with nine epic tips. There's levels to this game, so we've put together three artworks at three difficulty levels, noob, pro and epic, featuring our favourites boogeymen, Ghostface, Michael Myers and Freddy Krueger. Take what you need, ditch the rest, and let's get into the newbie tips. I'll be right back. What's happening people? I'm Clinton Lofthouse, a professional photographer and digital artist from the UK, and you're tuned into photomanipulation.com. The number one thing overlooked by newbies is actually one of the most important elements of photo manipulation, and that is du -du 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 stock images. Normally finding stock is easy. You basically jump onto any stock site like Adobe Stock to find all your pieces and begin building. To create horror movie fan art, you'll have to scour Google to find high-res photos of your character. Usually with an existing IP, most of the online images is our lower res to stop scoundrels like us basically from stealing them. Excellent. Most movie images online are low quality as they're just screenshots from the films themselves and that's really not good enough if you want to put together a sharp looking composite that slaps hard. As pros we never use Google image search for our work as most images are lower res. That means there's less pixels per inch making the images look fuzzy and low quality. One way you can get around the issue is to find photos of toys or something similar portraying our icons of horror. So how do you know if something is high or low res? There's a simple hack that can get you on the right track right away. Go to File, New, Print in Photoshop and choose either Letter, Legal or A4 from the presets. That's a print size document and is the size of standard sheet of paper. A good size to work out for detailed photo manipulation art. Head on over to Google, grab your images and paste them into your new print size document. As a general rule of thumb, bigger is always better when it comes to stock assets. When you zoom in, you'll be able to see if there's any JPEG artifacts or degradation, something to keep an eye on when creating your fan art. Choose the main focal image that works well for your print size doc and you're good to go. Just a side note, if you do use images found on Google of your characters, you cannot, and I repeat, cannot, Use them in commercial work or create prints or products of any kind. You'll end up getting sued by some of the most powerful movie making companies in the world and you don't want that, not at all. The better the images you manage to find, the better your final artwork will be and it's as simple as that. Now you're teed up with your high risk stocks that brings us to noob tip number two, foreground elements. One thing often overlooked by newbies is storytelling and we can really push that sense of time and place with foreground elements. Foreground elements do two things, they create depth in your artwork and they add to the story, usually because the elements are something that aligns with the theme of your image. For example, if you have a jungle themed artwork, your foreground element needs to fit the image slash story. So you may add some foliage in there or a wild animal or something even more subtle. Adding these elements builds up your imaginary world and adds to the story. For the Scream inspired image, it came quite naturally as our villain wouldn't be tearing down the corridor with a large knife for no reason. He would be chasing a victim, so all I had to do was find a stock image of a girl running that I could add into the foreground. It's pretty simple. With your foreground element matching the story and now in place, you can add a blur to it. This will create depth in your image as it mimics the focal planes of a camera, which then creates a sense of realism. You can use the tricks like this to make your 2D image feel more 3D. Filmmakers usually shoot with blurred elements in the foreground to create depth in their scenes. Otherwise, the shot could look pretty flat and we don't want that. No one wants a flat image. We can take inspiration from these movies and use it to develop our own depth in our own artworks. Creating the illusion of depth of field is super fast and super easy way for noobs to inject more realism and drama into an artwork. Try it out for yourself. You've learned a few things, but now it's time to push the tempo. Our final noob tip is GAC, also known as Greatest Area of Contrast. GAC is what we use to lead our viewers to our main focal point, and it elevates an artwork from mediocre to something more visual pleasing. GAC has been used by artists for thousands of years and is one of the most used compositional techniques to lead our eye to a specific area of the canvas. When you have lots of elements in an image, we need GAC to lead our eye to what we want to be seen first. In the screen image, Ghostface is obviously the focal point, but how do you make him stand out as he could get lost in the background elements? What we need to do is create a contrast between Ghostface and the background. 
You can do this by adding some neon green glowing light behind the focal character. Straight away, the black costume against the bright green creates a strong contrast and helps go first pop from the background, creating our greatest area of contrast in the whole image, and in turn, leading our eye to the focal point. Putting some backlight behind your focal element, in this case, go face, you can really ramp up the drama and impact of your artwork. This can be achieved with a soft edged brush and layer modes such as normal, hard light, or, I don't know, insert your own layer mode. It's quick, easy, and noob friendly. As you've probably noticed, most of our noob tips were traditional art theory techniques and I believe when you are a noob learning these foundational tricks will give you a better understanding of how to craft a killer image. You know, it's Halloween. I guess everyone's a tiny fucking scared. Things are ramping up, ladies and gentlemen. Let me introduce you to Mr. Michael Myers. Ba -ba -da -ba -ba -ba. <laughs> to create an artwork, you'll have to use some pro techniques and once you've mastered the basics, this is where things start to get fun. Let's jump into pro tip number one, which is turning day into night. The back plate used in this artwork is an image I found on Adobe stock of a house Halloween up to the nines, but it was taken during the day. Hands up anyone who has watched a horror movie before. Well, you will know that a lot of the mood from a horror movie comes from the time of day, generally night time. The night goes hand in hand with horror and as easily as Michael Myers goes hand in hand with kitchen knives. So to create the right mood for the image, I had to change the daytime Halloween house into a moody nighttime Halloween house. This was done with a mixture of curves and colouring. Using curves, I can pull down the highlights and darken the image. You don't have to do this with just one curves adjustment, you can use multiple adjustments and do it incrementally. Once we've got the moody tone we want, then it's just a case of adding some deep, dark blues, and this can be done with either gradient map, colour balance, or any of the other hundred ways to add colour to an image in Photoshop. As long as you darken the highlights, bring down the contrast with curves, and then add some dark blue colouring, we are usually good to go. As always, I suggest you play around with this and experiment and see what works best. Every image is different, so it will take different steps to get the same effect. Sounds confusing, but I think you get what I mean. One of the things I usually tell people to do is create your background first. Well, like a fool, this time I did not take my own advice for this artwork and I started model first, mainly because it was hard to find high res images of Michael so I needed to use the best photo possible. And that little screw up leads us to pro tip number two, adding motivated lights to our image. And by this, I mean adding in lights that match up with the lights on our model. If we want the scene to look realistic, then they both have to match. You can take some artistic liberties, but the light on both your background and subject needs to work together. Motivated light is used mostly in cinematography, but we as photo manipulators can use it too. For us, it's basically adding a fake light source for our light on our model. For this image, I decided to add some motivated light by adding in some porch lamps behind and to the side of Michael. These would then motivate the backlighting which was on him. It's simple yet very effective at helping the scene gel together. To create the lights, I took a stock image of a lamp from Adobe stock, masked it and then placed it onto the image. Then it was just a case of using a light coloured brush and blend modes to create the glow effect. I usually use the screen or linear dodge blend mode for lights like these. Make sure to add a little reflective glow on the wall around them because it adds to the realism of the image. The same technique was used to add glow to the pumpkins and in general is a great way to add light to any image. This is one technique I've used over and over again in lots of my artworks and I know for you, it'll just be as useful. So we have our motivated light, but now we need that motivated light to interact with the rest of the background. We do this by adding in rim lights and we add these to surfaces around the lights. This is the secret source that elevates an artwork from meh to wow. Again, with this, you can get away with artistic liberties. As long as it's, it kind of makes sense, you, it'll work. I also added some rim light to Michael, enhancing what was already there and adding some hair light. The hair light is always a nice touch for backlit people. To create it, I just sampled the highlight from my motivated light and used the hairbrush I found online and painted it in at 100%. Little details like this really help to blend and create realism. Adding rim light to your background can be a little more difficult if it's just one flat image. For example, if you try to paint up the straight edge of the banister, it will more than likely blend over onto the rest of the image. Unless you're some kind of Photoshop cyborg with the straightest line drawing imaginable, which I highly doubt that you are. 
So the second best way of doing it, after being a cyborg obviously, is to use the pencil as your guide for the straight edges. To do this, you need to create a path along the line of the straight edge that you're adding the rim light to, and then it creates a loop around and back to the bottom. You want to turn the path into a selection and then get your brush with your desired rim light color. I would suggest sampling the highlight from your motivated light and painting along the path you created with the pen tool. What will happen is the brush will paint along the selection without now bleeding onto the rest of your image. You will need to repeat this process on multiple surfaces at night and for it to look real. I added this light to the stairs banisters, the porch banisters, the leaves on the banisters and the little lamp. Nightmare on Elm Street. Is that the one where the guy had knives for fingers? Yeah, Freddy Krueger. So you put together your fan art piece and it's lacking a little something. Maybe it's a little flat or lacks emotional drama. It's time to inject some epic into this bad boy. Clinton put together a mock-up of this Freddy Krueger artwork using the newbie tips you just learned and it's good but not really as great as we'd really like. In this segment, I'm going to share three tips to take your work from meh to epic, including lighting effects, a getaway of paint technique, and some final processing tricks so your work will look just like the big dogs and creating phase runner. Groovy. Before we kick things off, I'm just going to break down a little of the prep work that went into this Freddy piece. As explained by Clinton, it could be really handy using toys as figure stocks for projects like this, but that can come with problems. You can get away with using toys for mask figures like Ghostface and Michael Myers, but whenever a faces or eyes are involved, things can look a little fake. To remedy this, I jumped onto Google, snagged a Freddy Krueger cosplay face at a good size from Wikimedia Commons, and got to work on leveling up this Photoshop. With the new head in place, things are already starting to look a lot better, so we'll get on to the first epic tip, light effects. One of the ways you can make your photo manipulation look less photographic and more of a stylized artwork is to bring in light effects. This can include atmospheric haze, backlighting and rim lights. To make things easier for you, I've included a download of this Freddy PSD in the description so you can get right in there and see exactly what colour adjustments were used to build up this piece. For the haze at the bottom, you can use a bright neon colour and a big old soft edge standard brush on layers set to hard light and overlay. These layer modes are great for laying down haze as the colour stays rich and saturated. You can use cloud, fog or mist images to lay texture over your haze. In this case, I use some mist from our epic overlays bundle, set to soft light. Link for those in the description below. When it comes to backlighting, you can get pretty fancy with Photoshop brushes. To create this ethereal looking haze behind Freddy, I used a cloud brush from Deharm and that was set to a blue tone and linear light layer mode. I haven't actually been using a tablet for all that long, believe it or not, so my hand isn't steady enough to create rim lights as sharp as I'd like. To create these rim lights, I set my pen tool to path, drew out the shapes of the rim lights I wanted, and filled with white. That's it. Always be conscious of your light sources. As you can see here, I wanted to capture the glow emitted from the skull, which catches on the hard edges left of the glove. Want to know how those spirit rays were cast from the skull? That's just a stock image from Adobe Stock set to screen. Jobs are good enough. So we're looking pretty funky with our light effects, now it's time to get our hands dirty with a little overpaint and that takes us neatly to epic tip number 3, ghetto overpaint. Now there's a good way of doing overpaint that involves sampling colours and repainting the image on a layer above and then there's a janky way of doing overpaint. That's what we're going to focus on today, the janky ghetto overpaint technique. Click on the smudge tool on the left of the tool panel and click the setting sample all layers. Create a new layer and start painting over the image on a new layer. With sample all layers set, the smudge tool will sample from the pixel data below and paint onto the new layer. Nice and easy. You'll want to follow the lines of direction when smudging, otherwise pixels will spill over to the elements and look wrong. So be cautious of following the natural direction when doing your overpaint. Why even bother with this though? The toy stock image was really low res with artifacts and pixel degradation. I really wanted to go for a painted 80s poster vibe, so the ghetto overpaint really helped make this piece look more stylized and artistic. You can see here that the face is really detailed, so I'm going to give you an alternative approach to the overpaint technique, and that works really well for finer, smaller details, and that's the amazing oil paint filter. Now, the issue with the oil paint filter is that it leaves these weird artifacts, usually on clothes and stuff, so it can't be used for everything, but for the Freddy face here, it works perfectly. You can use a combo of techniques to get the look you want. With everything looking nice and stylized, it's time to add a bit of flair and flavor to the final composite, and that brings us neatly to our third epic tip, processing. 
Using gradient maps to color process is a go-to technique by a lot of your favorite Photoshop artists, including Phase Runner, Encreate, and Benny Productions. Now, the trick here isn't to use a gradient map as is. There's a little bit of finessing required to get the rich color vibes that you're after. Add your gradient map adjustment layer and set the blend mode to overlay, around 65% opacity. Now it's a case of cycling through your gradient presets to get the color cast that works best for your piece. Tweak the layer opacity as necessary, and if needed, you can switch up the layer blend modes to get the look you want. Your artwork, your rules, baby. When you use the All Paint filter, your work can look a little soft and undefined, which isn't ideal when you want to create a high impact piece, but I have a hack for that. Create a stamped layer with the shortcut Command, Alt, Shift, and E that copies everything and puts it on its own layer. Use the filter High Pass, that's Filter Other High Pass, and choose a setting between 1.5 and 3. When you set that high pass layer to overlay, it restores all the details, but keeps the painted look. Now it looks sharper and more pleasing to the eye. Genius. And now for the finishing touches. A lot of artists, myself included, like to use the camera raw filter to add the final polish. Create another stamps layer at the top of the stack with the shortcut Command, Alt, Shift and E. That's Control for all my Windows hombres. And select Filter, Camera Raw. There's a lot of basic adjustments within the camera raw window, but I'm going to focus on just a few of my favorites, stuff that adds a nice finishing touch whenever you've used overpaint or oil paint techniques in your project. First up is clarity and texture, which is great for adding some cowbell to the details, but most importantly is my absolute favorite feature in the camera raw, and that comes under the effects panel, and that's grain. Adding a touch of green to your final piece gives that tactile, fine art finish, but most importantly, it does a great job of knocking out degradation or artifacts from your oil paint filter. It's a simple one-click process, but looks amazing. So there you have it, from Mare to Epic and a few simple tips, over to you, Clinton. And that's it for this week, folks. I hope you have a great Halloween. If you did like this video, be sure to check out my last video on creating fire in Photoshop. That's it. Thanks, guys. Peace.